Hi fam, it's Dylan's mum, Deborah. This is Dylan Friend. He gives you a back rub and says, you know, you're going well, Brian. Oh, it's special. Get comfortable being uncomfortable. Just keep showing up and find a way. Cam was so nervous he couldn't swallow water. Handed him a sheet of paper with six names and said, Sheet, we've got to cut these six blokes. Wow, shut up. I've just been barbed by a stingray, mate. I'm just yelling, oh, you saved my life, you saved my life, you saved my life. Thank you, thank you. I spent the last, I think it was a couple of weeks in jail. The deepest, darkest moments often bring about our biggest highs. Yeah, still in friends. Wow. Joel, how are you, my friend? I'm good, mate. Thanks for having me on. This is... I'm really excited today. <laughs> this is a, a, a pinch myself moment to, I'm not to get sure you about in this that. It is. It really is. So, a little um, bit of a... We've been meaning to do it for a while, we so have. I'm glad to get in here. Yeah, for, you wanted to get Howie Games done first. Is that what you, you said? Uh-huh. <laughs> well, he's <laughs> in my he, backyard. Yeah, I did okay. mention that to you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Mark, he wouldn't have let me off <laughs> no, if uh, I... <laughs> run down the road and uh, got this one in first. I didn't so. want to mention it, but it was just... I. In you know, saying that, it sounds like you two work pretty well together, so uh, yeah, you may be well, okay with that. Mark's good, you know, he touches on just the you know the front page sort of stuff. Ahead. <laughs> I like to sort of get a little bit more into dig the... Dig deeper. Yeah, dig deeper. It's, okay. it's beneath the surface right. level so, sort of podcast, so yeah, he's more of just a headline grabber. Well, let's um, go. I look <laughs> forward to digging into it today. I'm joking. He's a great man. Hey, um, mate, I swung by... Swing. I swung by... Um, the bookshop, Jesus Christ! Well, Wasn't many did left. I, did I kick you off the shelves Wasn't, or what? Uh, well, <laughs> well, yours are already gone. No, no, mine's already on discount. It's, it's, it's <laughs> like yours broke the bank. No. Hardcover, mind you. Yeah, like, it's hardcover. I, I didn't get the hardcover all in. Yeah, there wasn't many left. She said, Dylan. Because I'm a big, uh, I, I'm very well known down there at the local bookshop right. in Richmond. Yep. And she said, Dylan's good to see you again. What are you, what are you reading? I said, Look, I want to get a couple of Joel's books. And she goes, I've actually got a couple put aside for you. We don't, we're, really? we're selling out everywhere, but um, all in. Oh, I think she might be too kind. It's it's a, a bit of a surprise that they'd be sold out in Richmond anyway. No, they but, are. Uh, they are. Uh, mate, really good to do, to be honest. Um, the the memoir that we put together over sort of the last bit of last year and then early this year, but um, I didn't know how much I would enjoy doing it. Mm. Um, and more for me, like I didn't make too many headlines coming through the ranks and, you know, tipping the dirt over and doing sort of naughty stuff, if you could say that. But it was more that I realized when sitting down and putting it on paper that, geez, I've worked with some good people mm. and um, and had a lot of people to thank. And, and that's what I felt at the end of the, you know, when I finished the book. Um, I was a little bit nervous, to be honest, to start when I was like, oh, I just never liked having it on paper, um, you know, words on paper, and then people can read it and maybe articulate it a little bit differently to what I thought it may be, but uh, I'm pretty happy with it. And I don't think I've lost any friends. That's good. Well, I'm not sure if well, I have. Maybe, but... maybe you just didn't have many. <laughs> well, <Yeah>. true. <laughs> no, well, that's true too. You do become qu- quite a loner at different stages being a captain, but... Uh, yeah, I enjoyed doing it. It's um, mate, it's incredible, and I, I know so many people who have um really enjoyed the book um thus far. I'm still sort of making my way through my own, so I'll, I will get to this. <laughs> but I thought what is even better is to actually get you in person and and have a chat. Couldn't couldn't recommend this one more. We're actually going to do um, I haven't told you about this, but I'm going to get you to sign a sign couple of up. these, and we'll do a giveaway to uh, out there the fraternity. Too good. And um, and if anyone can win one and get their hands on these bad boys, we could. There one we go. thing I know about you is. In all seriousness, that you're an incredible person, but a very humble person. And okay, it, that is, where's this no, going? No, you're a very, very <laughs> humble person. You are. And the the funny part about this book is, I knew straight away how much convincing did it have to like for this quote at the bottom. <laughs> I can imagine. Were you uncomfortable with Chris Scott saying these uh, words, or how did they much convince you? It says at the bottom, yeah, the best player I have ever seen, Chris Scott. I didn't, Which is not a lie. Well, no, no, I didn't love it going on the front, um, but the publisher, uh, you know, at the end of the day, get their way in, in a lot of things. Uh, it was a piece cut short too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because Chris um, was talking about you know all round club and involving you know thinking of others and whatnot. So um, I think he's had some pretty good players in his time doing the same thing. So uh, even to even for him to half say that, uh, I appreciate it. Don't love it being on the front, but uh, I do love the man. <laughs> it's um, it's funny as well when you uh, did you ask him f- to do I it? I didn't. So you I know, they asked. No, no, I don't, I don't even know if they asked. So, yeah, right. They just used yeah, it. Yeah, you just got to be careful. Yeah, you that's do. what uh, yeah, Chris has learnt there. There you go. Because uh, now he's on paper. As I said before, it can be dangerous. I um, 
had to ask my right. people to recommend the book. Yep. And it was like one of the most awkward conversations you can ever have. Because they're like, do you want us to ask? And yes. I was like, well, that's even worse. Like, I've got to sort of ask if they will recommend it. It's not you, a comfortable situation. I'm sure you would have been fine. No, it, it, I was going to call you, but it, it <laughs> didn't come through. Um, mate, how have you been? What's been happening? It's uh, It feels like it's yesterday that you, you were still playing. It's been almost 12 yeah. months now. I can't, you know, mate, it's crazy. It goes so fast. Um, a year that's, you know, thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, took a break from footy, so uh, didn't go back into any club land or um, back within the AFL ranks at any stage this year. More from the point of view that... Um, just take a break and have a look from the outside, be the fan. Um, mm. I loved my time um, at the Geelong Footy Club, 16 years. Could count the bad days on sort of oh, two hands maybe, even one hand. Like I just – and not many players get to say that, like um, ebbs and flows of form and um, just falling out of love with hard work at different stages. But I loved it. Um, so for me to finish up, you know, Probably people around me were more worried that I would find it really difficult, but probably helps that you go out winning. Um, end of 2022, um, went out with a side that I just love playing with too and the players. So um, thoroughly enjoyed that, the people that I worked with. But then um, it was time to get into the next phase of life and that was a, a little son that came along in February, which has just changed our lives, tipped it upside down for all the better. Um, and then my wife, she wanted to live overseas for a period of time. So this was a, a six month to a year dream, probably a little bit more. And I, I sort of did the trade with her that if we go on a big holiday, um, which was a couple of months early in the year, um, then would that be a pass mark? So that was good to do. Good negotiation. So she wanted to do a year overseas. Yeah, and to be honest, the two months that we went for probably cost me more than what the year would would have. So that's what happened. I don't know if it yeah. was a smarter decision or a t you know a bad decision in the end. But it was, um, yeah, we took Joey over. We were two months. Uh, sorry, he was three months old. Um, no teeth, couldn't crawl, just a perfect little age. Love sleeping in dad's hands, which is nice. Um, and then uh, he was breastfeeding, so. Just a little dream, baby. What's he up to at the moment? Because we're uh, busy. busy. Yeah. Is he crawling yet? Yep. Yeah, oh, yeah. crawling. Uh, he's just about to have the two front teeth drop down um, from up above. So oh, it was a four, what was it, quarter to five wake up this morning, which he's usually pretty good. Is so, he sleeping through at the moment? Yeah. Yeah, that's yep, good. Yep. Um, so we've been lucky uh, with him, to be honest. He's just... Uh, Every so everywhere that we think that we're going to have a little bit of trouble, whether it be just to travel to Melbourne from Bowen Heads, so that's a ninety-minute drive. We're like, mm, what time of day should we do it? Just do it, like, and he'll he'll work it out and um, get with the program at the end of the day. So he's been sleeping through. We, we, yeah, we feel very fortunate that yeah. he's given us the start to parenthood that we've we've had. Did you ever do the um the dream feed? Did you ever try that? So how it works? So Brit breastfeed. Yep. Um, and we didn't do that 11 o'clock one like yeah. some do. We we went off sort of when he woke, so which is a bit of a maybe wrong. We, we, we didn't Mate, know. There's Mate, no right way to know, do anything. Like, you, yeah, we, just, we were just sort of having a go at a little bit of everything. So I would do a um, bottle and, yeah, we would take it in turns, night on, night off, basically. How funny. But I loved is, it. Did you, like, yeah, I the, loved the middle of the night. Yeah. Like, um, did you like the middle? I, I liked the late one. Yeah. The middle of the night was a, that was Was a that tough? That was a trouble um, for me. So we, yeah, I don't know. I just, there was that moment where you like know that no one's up. You're up with him and uh, you just get lost in it. You're busy. You change the nappy over. You give him the bottle. And then I've learned that then I need to change the nappy over again. So oh, I quickly learned that just give him the bottle and then... Do it at the end. And then do it it's, at the end. I so. did it literally made the same mistake this morning. He got up, he wet, like wet himself everywhere. It's amazing how much their bodily fluids just don't phase you nah. either. Like he could do anything to me and I'm just like, oh, that's okay, that's that's all good. Oh, I, the the change is uh, the solids and the, just it's, the smell that... Uh, I don't know what Max is doing. It's not, it's not good, man. <laughs> oh. It's really bad. It's really bad. It, it's it's quite amazing. Comes to be up honest. the back a lot. Like I don't know if I'm not well, putting the nappy, nappy on properly. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's your problem. Yeah, is that me? Don't blame your tools. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, you gotta just tighten it up a bit more. I don't know I don't what's know. going on. No, no, I don't know. But yeah, I think you're to blame. <laughs> that's me. Probably okay, for that one. Right. You can't. Yeah, you can't blame anyone but yourself. Um, yeah, it's been an incredible journey. Like fatherhood is. Um, 
is for me as well it's been like just the coolest most incredible thing and i just find myself i just went on a trip to bali as well for yep. two weeks and it was funny that you say brit was wanting to do the one year away because Charles, my partner is, is saying the exact same thing she's already sort of looking at europe next year can yep. we uh, you know stay away for sort of three months to four months and you know we're sort of negotiating on the time as well but it is so cool going away when they're at a similar age like max um seven months still not doing too much and we had a yep. incredible nanny i've spoken about on this podcast like nearly brought me to tears how beautiful this person was that, that helped us through it but family holidays making memories making moments has been pretty special yeah and like little do we know but just um life as i knew it before that and brit was the same like you know when we met and you know everyone sort of knows you or you, you know you're pigeonholed to you know the geelong captaincy and um so for us to go overseas and not know anyone mm. um we were where'd we go uh, we went to spain and then we went to the bottom of france and then we went up to london for a month then we went back to spain so it was just a great little period where we just got lost in the three of us and mm. um, enjoyed our time bumped into very few people that we knew but um it was not by choice but it was more just enjoy our time over there yeah, um, awesome. which was great so cool it's so cool um journey to to fatherhood and i suppose like we've sort of chatted off here about this before and I, I still remember so much i want to sort of chat to you about today but last year we did a chat with the draft picks yep. of the things and when i say we i was interviewing you for the for um the discussion so we're sort of talking about you know leadership and being a young player and um uh, you know how to present yourself going to a club how to earn respect and all those bits and pieces do you remember yep. the chat yep, we had I do. yeah crazy it was it was really insightful and I felt like it was such a good discussion because and I'm not saying this in a negative way to put myself down but it was cool to have someone of your ilk that's done what you've done and then someone maybe that hadn't taken those opportunities as well chatting to these young guys yep. um, was super special and I remember at that period this is a long winded question that I'm getting to the answer <laughs> somewhere is at that period as well you'd sort of had just come out talking about yours and Brit's um, journey to to get Joey and to have yep. him in your life and at that period Juz and myself had also been through um, our own journey in, in IVF and, and conceiving pregnancy and that was the first time I'd ever been like I'd always had respect for you of what you'd done but I was like fuck man like I'm not alone in this journey I'm not like the only one who's been through this stuff if this yep. can happen to Joel Salwood, the captain of Geelong Cats and, and Brit and their life, and it can happen to anyone? Yeah. It, it's uh, one that we... It was, it was, to be honest, it was writing the book, mate. And, yeah. Um, when I did it, I wrote the chapter about IVF and then I um, sat through it with Pete Ryan who helped me also write the book. And I said, oh, Pete, I, I've, I, I haven't done it properly and then tried it again with him and then it was like, nah, we're not gonna get this right. We sort of need to bring Brit in because uh, that just, you know, tells the full story of everything too. So, um, but the, the thing about like, I wanted to be a footballer when I grew up, like a, I'm talk, going back, I was uh, six, seven years old. I just wanted to play footy, but I wanted to be a dad too. And I wanted to run in the Olympics. Unfortunately, I don't think I, th I may have to let that one go. In Paris, is, <laughs> no, is no, 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 no. Um, so, you know, it was really like I didn't know when I was going to do it. And I look back on my time now, and I, I didn't need to do it through um, my time when I was playing. But I would have, you know, Brit and I would have would have loved to. We got married uh, the start of 2020, um, and just like life we thought you get married you have a little honeymoon period and then you know you look to become mum and dad um for us it was the start of covid too so we didn't know what that was going to do to us but you know we tried for a period of time and then realized that it maybe might not happen just an easy way so we spoke to our gp who we were away with at the time um up on the gold coast uh within the footy camp and um and he said, oh, look, have you, you know, have you had a chat, you know, do you know where your sperm's at and all this? And this is the first time that I've, you know, ever heard of sort of going to, you know, a bank and trying to find out, you know, what's going on with all that. So fertility issues, we just didn't think that it was probably a problem um, for us um, or even thought about it. But then when we look back on it, we would be like, oh, okay, there's maybe things 
in the loop that maybe should have got us onto it. We could have kept banging away probably shouldn't use that word <laughs> <laughs> um, and we may have been lucky to get there but um but yeah w- we found we took the track that we should probably head down the ivf if we were going to try and fast track things mm. um, and we we had that advice from the doctors it's crazy um when you go through something like that you have this like relationship with your wife mm. or your partner and i feel like that first step of like those meetings with doctors and stuff like that your relationship just goes to this weird new level yeah of like fuck like we're really in this together <laughs> yeah. like yeah, there's yeah. some really weird conversations that unless you've um been through that and not that you'd wish it upon anyone but there is some beauty in the level of connectiveness that you have through that period as hard as and shelling as it is oh man yeah, days, yeah. It well summed up because i i think back to the time now and you know getting married is great but you know really you're signing a piece of paper and then two weeks later people go you know do you feel any different not really like I've got the ring on my finger and that's about it um, through those meetings uh, that you talk about with doctors and um, counselors so mm. that was my first whack um, you know and um, from Brit I must say so to go through an IVF process as you would know you we we're doing it down in Melbourne, so we had to, we did it by phone interview. Mm. Britt's a school teacher, and I just asked her, I was at the footy club this day, uh, working away. I said, oh, do you mind coming down to the footy club so we can have that meeting um, with the counsellor, meaning her, leave work, come do that. And I just didn't read the play that well. You know, I had a, we had the private room at the footy club, um, soundproof and all lucky, uh, because she hit me between the eyes going, hey, he's got this footy shit going on and I have probably a fair understanding of what IVF's going to be, but he's got no fucking idea. Mm. And and with that, it was like, I better get with the program. You know, she's calling me out here to say, be with her every step of the way. So any meeting from then onwards, you know, whether it be down in Melbourne or anything like that, I just had to give the footy club the heads up once that was basically it i said to um, scotty and um, simon lloyd who was a footy manager at the time i said hey we're gonna brit and i are gonna do this thing ivf um, it's down in melbourne gonna need to take days off uh, you know every now and then or a morning off and they're like yeah go for it and i didn't even at times it was more me just then passing on to sort of the guys that were looking after my running program and just making sure that my body was ticking over just say i won't be in for the morning and they're like yeah fine Mm. um and with that Mate, it's sort of like I just got lost in the IVF clock. You know, the footy clock was second, um, and you would know what the IVF clock is, you know, all involved around a period, and then you go on this cycle. um, And for the girls, you know, they live it every minute of the day. So for Brit and Juzzy, it was like, um, I don't know, Brit loved school. You know, it was her outlet. So we would have an embryo transfer um, down in Melbourne, and then I'm like, okay, home now rest up she's like no no i'm going back to school i was going back to footy you know drop her off at home and then back to footy she's like i'm going back to school and you know i just had to listen to her you know all through these periods you know if she wanted to do those things um and felt well enough then you know just do it i had a lot to learn (laughs) i deal grew up with uh three brothers no sisters uh a really tough mum. So not in a bad way, but she was just rock solid. Um, but yeah, learned plenty about, you know, the woman's body and um, and what they go through. It's incredible. Like, I think so many, like here you talk, I go back to so many moments where I was hit between the eyes as well. And I'll sort of talk about that in a minute, but like the amount, I feel like through the process of IVF, I could nearly administer yeah. a cycle myself. Like yeah. just because you do it so many times and you're just like, that's a joke obviously doctors are yeah. doing IVF and we're not going down that path but you just do get so addicted to like the research and for anyone out there thinking it's like you know naturally when you fall pregnant it's at that four week mark but yep. through IVF it's like you're actually starting from zero yeah so you start well you're actually starting from minus four weeks really because yeah, yeah. you're starting in and then going so it's where someone would already be there four weeks you're going back like eight or twelve or six weeks whatever that cycle is and it's it's just such a fucking long time and stress and all these things and loopholes that you've got to jump through. But we um similar. I don't know if it was similar to you at all, but like with 
Jazz and I's relationship through that time it was obviously really connected because you can I, I was probably she wanted to she was really good at communicating with yep. me and I think what you were saying before about listening like I don't think I did that very well like I was very um in somewhat of a way like embarrassed isn't the right word but I was like I felt like a lot of shame around talking about it with friends or yep. being able to like talk to my mates about it or I just didn't want to talk about it at all like it was yeah, such yeah. it was such a f- heartbreaking thing like that you're going through I was like let's just forget about it I don't want to even think about it until we have to go out in the meeting again or we know when it is we'll talk about it then yeah yeah whereas she got comfort in talking with me and like yep. researching and things so I think that was a big we had probably a pivotal moment where she's like look I fucking need you to communicate with me on yeah, this stuff yeah. and I need to like I wanted to keep it a secret I didn't want to tell anyone didn't want to tell my mum didn't want to tell my dad didn't want to tell my sister didn't want to tell my mates whereas she's like I want to tell my friends yep I was like well we've got to do what you want to like you're the one yeah. going through this I can't be the person to, to not do that so it's just that those uh, plays it's, it's such a good point though because everyone does it differently like we chose to try and keep it close knit because we were probably similar to you um, that we wanted to be able to live and have something else um, and not the jazzy dinner but it was like mm. we just wanted to be able to just try and be normal for periods of the day um, and know that it's there but you're like the injection's going to come at 7.30 at night and you're on the clock and you know I'm away say in Adelaide um, organising my best mate from Geelong to come down and uh, you know make sure that he's giving the needle to Brit because she didn't like giving needles to herself so yeah. you're like um, you, you become way more organised you're talking about your relationship and where it went to mate we fell more in love than yeah. ever before because you had to um, you had to have each other um, and that's yeah maybe the choice that we had by not telling anyone because mm. we were like we had to lean on each other um, but geez yeah, there's some hurdles along the way and the thing about um, IVF too that probably we should mention is that no probably IVF journey is the same like, no. we went on so many different cycles <clears throat> through well to get Joey in the yeah. end um, and treatments and you know to to get where he was that you know we can't sit here today and go geez you should do this you know if you're the partner of uh, you you know the female that you were having the baby with you should tell her to do this because there's no perfect no. way you know you just got to go in there listen to the doctors be really confident that the doctors are the right ones for you and um just be the support network yeah and just stick with each other as hard as it is like you have those down days you have the up days but it's um you do form this like unformidable bond that is is pretty special and now like you know i get emotional talking about it you you see him i do this really weird thing it's borderline creepy i don't even know i should sort of say it but whenever newborn like you'd be in bed at night and you bring the baby in because they're not sleeping yeah. like, i just get up and still to this day like take photos of them sleeping next to yeah. each other and it's just like the coolest thing ever because i think more so you than me you get touted as being a footballer and like yep. this tough player that's brave and puts their head over the pill and all these things but then you see what your your partner or your wife goes through when they go through fertility battles mentally and physically and you're just yep. like you're the toughest motherfucker i've ever seen yeah, in my yeah, life yeah like, yeah yep. and they do need to be at different stages yeah. unfortunately um and there's no they don't get any degree out of it or anything mm. like that or and sometimes in silence um as you know that they do it but my god yeah you, you get you get a appreciation for what um the woman does and goes through um i think back to early days of you know a transfer and then you're living the week you know not the day but the week oh, too and you, you like the next blood test next blood test okay good resolve uh okay not it's not as, yeah. not as good. <laughs> not as good. Oh, no, no. This is not good. So, yeah. Um, real roller coaster. It's the biggest roller coaster. Of the, easily, hands down, the, the hardest thing I've, I've been through in my life. Yeah. Um, on, obviously, can't speak on behalf of our partners here, but for yourself, could you measure that in another time, like through your career, in terms of like um, seeking support or like people to talk to or anything like that did that arise for you like did you find comfort in anything like even just yeah. if there's a female or male listening out there today i know we're not giving advice or anything but just personally for yourself did you find 
that anything helped you? Oh, Dill, it's funny. Um, I see, I never spoke to anyone coming through. I always saw myself as like a pretty mentally fit guy. Mm. Um, and it was my final year without knowing that it was going to be my final year that I started speaking to um, someone. Um, her name was Anna Box. Um, Anna then started working within the footy club um, down at Geelong. And she was just helping me more with what was to come, you know, transition of yeah. my life and stuff like that. And not that we knew it was going to be them, but in, it was going to be within the next 48 months, if yeah. not. So, and what I learned um, through Anna was just, she sort of looked at me and and then I was like, looked at her back and then, I don't know, she, there was just a smile and I, I was like, I could tell you anything here. Yeah. And it was more the rifting that I did with her that, um, you know, I had some challenges uh, within my last year of footy. Um, yeah, I was going to sit out five games. Or no, it wasn't at that stage. We didn't know what it was going But I was going to take games off throughout the year. Um, and that was going to be a challenge for me because I'd been a, not like all players have got egos, but, you know, when you're the captain of the side, you probably you got a bigger one at different mm. stages. So when round four come around and I was still feeling fresh and we're playing Brisbane down at um, GMHBA, and they're a top four side uh, from the previous year. You want to bruise them and you want to make sure that you're a part of that game that they'll remember for later on in the year. Um, on the Thursday night, I got told that I'm not playing. And um, I saw Britt saw it. Yeah, Britt saw um, the message had come through. And Scotty and I had had this conversation before the season had started. But that came too quick for me. So the next morning I went in there and I said, oh, coach, are we, so I'm not in. He's like, yeah, no, no, not in. Um, part of the plan we'll um get the side together and you'll be back the following week you know easter monday so i'm like oh, i don't want to miss that one too so um it, within saying that like the, they just fell at unbelievable times around the ivf stuff you know we just had a bad result with brit that week too so all my energy levels through my last year of footy were up and down like and it was playing around the coach but I don't know whether he saw it in me or not, but um, he just chose the perfect times to give mm. me the times off. Like um, that game, so I had sat out and the boys knocked it out of the park. Like I was sat in the game day, the week, the day before, the planning for Brisbane, and I was at home watching the game. Um, and I'm, I'm never at home; I'm always at the game. If not, but because we had the bad news, I was home with Brit. And I was just like giving fist pumps. And then by the third quarter, I was like, how the fuck am I going to get back in this not, side? Not, not too good, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, they, they're going so well. So the growth of me getting out of the way um, was like made them better. Um, and I didn't know that at the stage at round four. Yeah. We got to round 11-ish around that time where we were playing Melbourne at home, um, ex-premier, want to, you know want to make sure that we play well against them even if we don't win um let's let's make sure we i had the week off the week before so i was going to be cherry ripe to go that morning brit did her first pt session and um she was pregnant at that stage mm -hmm. um and you know we'd had some good news and i was um at home she rang me from the pt she goes oh, i'm bleeding and I'm like, oh, fuck, okay. Um, let's just go straight to the OB mm -hmm. and we'll get checked out. So that was um, at Etworth in Geelong at the time. And we got there. I met her there. Um, and for some reason, because it was so small at the time, the embryo, like it would have been maybe two weeks in, like we just couldn't see a, um, a heartbeat on or hear a heartbeat on the scanner that they had. So then we had to go downstairs to the one that's more and this is game day against melbourne and i was so pumped for this game and all that and just completely forgot about it um so it was at about four to five hours um we would at the etworth finally got the good news that everything's okay um heard the heartbeat for the first time that i don't think that, maybe shouldn't have mentioned that because the lady wasn't supposed to let us hear it um but it was like you know three weeks in wow. you know the at this stage of girls you probably may not even know that they're pregnant um but because we, yeah yep 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 so we were um yeah it was unbelievable so but by the time that um we got the good news from upstairs from the guy that was looking after us 
Brits decided um, to ask him, so will I be right to go to the footy to watch tonight? And he's looked at me and, I, and I'm going, mate, no, nah, she's not going to the she's footy tonight. Home, yeah. <laughs> she's going home. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I dropped her home and off I went to the footy about 4.30, which is a little bit earlier than normal for a 7.30, 7.40 game. And um, I was just driving in. I was like exhausted already. Um, but because I had the week off the week before, I was like, I'm going to get stuck in tonight. I'm going to have the biggest game of my life, like against Melbourne, you know, time to, you know, leave them with something that they're going to remember. I sat on the bench for the first, like for the start of every quarter. And I hadn't done that since my first year. And I sort of didn't really know, like it wasn't a part of the planning. Um, and there was a hit to the ego mm -hmm. and I was sort of come in on the Monday and I, Anna, who I spoke about before, I said, Anna, this happened on the weekend about the footy, not so much um, the Joey situation. And she's like, well, I said, I want to tell you first because Sean Griggs, a, a good young coach and I just, if I went at him, you know, I'll probably, I'm seeing red at the moment. And she goes, well, why do you think that he did it? And I'm like, well, I'm not sure. But even just that conversation that I had with her and speaking to someone, mm -hmm. Help me go to him and go, hey, what's you know, what's the go? And I just said, oh, I just had the week off before, so I thought I was ready to go. He goes, well, you just should have told me, and we could have started you. But then I was like, no, 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 it's over to you now. And I just had to back him in that you know he do your plan and mm -hmm. um, and stick with it. We beat Melbourne by 20, 30 points that night. Everything went to plan. Um, but the the best thing about it was obviously got through the day. And it wasn't about footy. And I got to the end of the game. There was no emotion about footy. It was just like, okay, get home quickly. I don't think I even jumped in the pools or the ice bath. It was like, get home. Is he all right? So it quickly turned. Like my life just quickly turned without people knowing that um, something bigger was happening. How crazy is like when you go, and just in life at all, I hate this saying like everything happens for a reason. It's the worst quote of all time. But yeah. timing is one thing that, there's no analogy around it, but fuck, it's eerie how timing can yep. relay into like things. And you spoke before about Scotty sort of resting certain weeks and yep. games that had this and then bench. Like, it's just eerily how sort of it plays out when you've sort of got things going on in your off yeah. life as well. Yep. I don't know. He, he may have seen little yeah. things in me um, or spoken to, you know, different people, whether it be Hawk, who's probably the closest to me, Tom yep. Hawk down there. But um, I just, yeah, just read the play really well. How was um, you spoke about that, and I, and I really appreciate the openness and honesty of that because I wouldn't believe you if you if you said it didn't hurt the ego anyway. Because yeah, I think the the best thing, um, one of the coolest quotes I've loved through the show is um, we had Juddy on like really early days, and he said that ego gets a bad rap. Like, yep. you ego is a really good thing to have yep. if you've done the work and if you've earned it. Okay, yep. ego is only bad when you haven't done the work and you don't deserve it. So any healthy male or female that is competitive and is an athlete and is want to go well in life, you need it there. Yeah, yeah. But it's just keeping it in check and knowing that you, you know, have earned that ego in it. So you've got this ego that's healthy, it's in check. But then throughout that season, having the conversations with Scotty, Anna, yep. Sean Grigg, as you're saying, around it, like, did you, were you as proactive in like, having the chats with them or did, did at stages did it get a bit awkward like was it no nah, no nah, nah, yeah. never awkward which was uh, you know it, the relationships were built there Strong. which was like i think that definitely helped um the thing about it was too like we we were like and i'm speaking to the younger players and mm. listen in here but we always made sure that the younger players are the boss of themselves um when they come in you know you're the ceo of yourself so We'll help you in every single way and I'll never give up on you. But be ready that something's going to be tough and you're going to come up against it sometimes and it's not going to fall your way, whether it be selection or, you know, you, you not, don't kick the goal that you need to kick. Um, mm. But be ready that uh, when it's worth it, you, you'll uh, actually really enjoy it, you know. And through that you know the relationship stuff i just think that was really important that we at geelong were able to form down there you know you live in each other's back pocket a little bit um by being a one town club uh, use that to your advantage you know the boys do stuff together golf and 
you know, tamping bowling and just simple things. Uh, coffee's easy to get. It's five yeah. minutes around the corner rather than being in Melbourne and you're like looking at your watch whether to beat traffic or not. So very fortunate. Speaking like of the culture at Geelong, it's something that you know is well known and I know you spoke about like the geographical sense of it and everyone's yep. down there. It's that town, a country town in a city sort of mindset and players love being down there. Like we had, you know, Zach Tui on the show said the same thing. It's just this, it's almost like a, a cult of <laughs> players that have. But who would you say, there's so many big names yep. and so many incredible people, players, yep. personalities, including yourself, right up the top of people. Like I had to write some down before because there are so many. Like you look at guys you started out with, like Cameron Ling, Chapman, um, Stevie J, Gary Ablett, Jimmy Bartel, Tom Hawkins, yep. Tom Harley, a big one that I know probably now has moved into more of a, a business side of things. Is he yep. CEO? At, he is. Unbelievable. Yep. Like, yeah, incredible. Yeah. You look at these guys that have had unbelievable times in football, but have helped probably... Well, the question is, has... Is that when that sort of culture and teamness started, like in your early years and has oh, carried on through? Yeah. I mean, I didn't know it before that I walked into the yeah. footy club, but when I walked in and what I saw, um, I used the picture of there'd be a computer over there and there's um, a young player with an older player teaching him how to play the game. And the old player's not going to give up his spot, but he's he's okay if the young player steals it um, because it means that the place is, you know, the footy club's going to be in a better place. So, and, I, and I'm happy to say that when I left um, at the end of 2022, that that was still the same. You know, it didn't change over a period of time. Um, you want to bring them through. It doesn't matter what background that they've had or anything like that you give them a chance um probably a little bit more black and white on the game plan early days um in what i mean by that is like you knew what the standard was you had to um be respected before you were liked so you had to go train hard um and you know bust everything get the best out of yourself and that suited me um didn't suit some other players that didn't come from that or you know learning the game they needed you know I think of Tom Lonigan who got injured um, in about his fourth or fifth year where it was a life ending injury really um, and then he you know got a couple of extra years through a rookie list and then back onto the list mm -hmm. and end up lasting 10 years 200 games and you're like he was and he, he continues to say it but he would have been better drafted as a 22 year old rather than an 18 year old and there's so many players like that so um we yeah we're very fortunate that it doesn't matter your background where you come from um you try and set it up for the individual whether it be the young northern territory kid coming down what's going to suit him to play his best footy come a sad day um, is the most important thing. It was a really evident that, you know, when we did chat to the, the draft picks and when I was, you know, asking you yep. what you looked for as a captain when young players would come into the club and just what you said before about that being liked versus being respected. And yep. I think that was something that in football clubs, um, obviously you would have seen it done both ways and, and you can change, right? Like you can you can come in and be an idiot and, and learn if, you, if you're lucky enough because time yep. does go quick. But spoken about it a lot like when i first sort of got started it was all about just how can i fit in how can i yeah. ease my way into this you know incredible place that you want to hang out with players you want them to like them and and i'm not putting blame on absolutely anyone at all but at that stage there wasn't much sort of support coming from younger older guys because at that time at a club yeah it was like those guys didn't feel safe so why yep. would they be helping out anyone else along the journey to, to take their spots which which is a really hard thing to navigate and as you said if you don't have that strong culture the whole time it's really hard to get young guys coming through yeah and uh, i just give credit to the guys that i had around me mm. um at the time who would be like a massive oh, influence like on ling you? and harley yeah um but johnson bartel you shouldn't have made me do this because i'm going to miss someone and they're going to give me a call but yeah. the, right through um and that and they were all different you know um and sometimes, you know, the boys didn't get along with each other, yeah. but they knew what to do for each other come a weekend. Well, that was the, not the one of the most special things, but how we could get each other, you know, up for a game and bring out the best in each other was just so special. Well, it's 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 awesome that you brought that point up. And, and this isn't your words. This is my, yep. of what I've sort of heard through the grapevine. It might, it might be public, might be not, but the relationship between someone like Chapman and Stevie J, yep. like apparently off field would clash a lot and 
different personalities, but come day, game day, they would be competitive beasts against each other and have that respect on field. Yeah, and that's what it takes at, at you know good clubs and yeah. good businesses to to succeed. Uh, exactly, and yeah, the two names that yeah have been on the record, but. Um, what they did for each other, they knew that when they pulled that jumper on, that they what well, they knew what they needed to do for mm. the side, um, and and that was absolutely perfect, you know, for the rest of us. Mm. Um, at times, it actually helped the footy club not to get in a stale position because they yeah. were so challenging. They were driven to get so good, um, and they made us better. Who? This is such a, it's such a shit question. Like it's so shit, but it, I really want to know, and it's. It, I feel like you get asked this all the time, but just teammates that you loved train, like not even playing with, but just having as everything, Uh, just most well-rounded people that you go, you know what, I'm picking a team. These three guys are are coming to war with me. Oh, you know, Dill, this is... um, It's a hard... Well, it's not really because the guys guys that I love, and it it might be strange, but I think of the, the guys that were on the edge of the side. Yeah. Uh, but then they would go to back and behave unbelievably well. For a young captain, I was captain of 23, and they would go back to the VFL and just like knock it out of the park and suit up every time and you be- behave this way and play this way. Because it's, it's okay to go sit on the computer with them come Monday, but when you're not taking the field with them at a VFL or anything like that come the weekend, then it can get lost if they're not around the right support. So um, I feel really fortunate that I had a number of those guys and I, yeah, I, I, the guys that come to mind, um, Brother Scott, um, George Hall and Smith, um, Lockie Henderson. And when I'm thinking of the 22 Premiership, this is the guys that yep. I'm thinking of, like they weren't a part of the side um, or even the squad in 2022 but we had grown through this period of Jed Buse that was in the premiership side Zach Guthrie Tom Atkins Tom Stewart and they had these guys around them so mm. um, they you know it just blossomed that you know when we're talking about culture yeah I, as captain you take a little bit of credit for it but I just thank that those guys that I had on the edge you know that aren't everyday names that you know the footy club will or the supporters will know how much of an impact they had. But from my point of view, massive. Um, Zach Smith, um, Link McCarthy. I remember when we played the grand final up in Queensland against Richmond and it was um, making sure those boys had a ticket to the game because they were all up there for different reasons. Um, But they were a big part of what we were doing then, not only in 2022, but like the flow on effect that they had those early days they were so important to our culture link was playing for brisbane at the time and we beat him in a prelim but he was you know geelong person you know you pull on the jumper once you've pulled it on forever no it's special i think what's really cool and evident today like talking to you and and not to take because a big part of this that i love and i want to ask you about later is like the recruiting side of geelong and getting people in and good people good players good people yeah and you look at players like tom stewart um tom atkins who two of my favorites that come to mind there's there's countless others that have done it the tough way and you love watching players like that. And on one hand, you go, that's incredible recruiting. Like, yeah. how good's that? Yep. But on the other hand as well, nearly as equally, if not as equally, 50-50, is you go, well, if they were put in a, if they were put in another club where they didn't have good leaders around them, that we're watching game vision with them, we're giving them feedback, we're wanting them to take their own spot, those guys might not have done what they've done. They're not, they might not be premiership players. Yeah. Yeah. Um not taking I, anything away from no, them. Yeah, well, that's yeah, what that's, that's where heart. I'm going. Yeah. And I think you so saw those, that in my eyes yeah, straight I did. away. You because, wanted to kill me. Um. <laughs> no, no. No, what I wanted to do was say, I, I like Tyson Stengel come to mind. Yeah. And it's like, we as a footy club um, get a pat on the back for Tyson Stengel, but he did it all himself, yeah. to be honest. Like, um, he just needed to be given another chance, uh, have the right environment that he could feel safe to go to work. And to pl- do what he loves mm. and that's play footy on the biggest stages in the biggest moments kick the biggest goals um, and that's what he loves doing so set it up that uh, he can do what he does mm. um, and that's you try and do that for each individual and some you get right some that you don't um, but it's uh, that's that's the challenge of being a leader you know how can you make this environment that Tyson loves coming to work so does Tom Stewart and Tom Atkins and, and the next one you know the kids straight out of school too maybe we can say there's a, a really 
fantastic cocktail of <laughs> recruiting good players, yeah, good people yeah. first, hard workers, but also in a good mix of good leaders around them that work hard and want the best for them. Yeah. And that's and, probably yeah. too long. I don't know. I just learned so much out of mm. every kid that you go. I, I talk about going to, you know, you do school visits as um, – a part of the AFLPA and the AFL process of being a player, and we have a um, we have a setup that an older player goes with a young player. So the older player will help take the first session with the young player, and then it gets sort of flipped around where you yeah. sort of help the young player limp through it in the afternoon. Um, and it's so good. Like you're sitting in the car, you're driving out, and I used to love, you know, talking to Quint Narco about, you know, growing up and, uh, you know, what mum's doing and stuff like that. And you, you, because you just wouldn't get it. Some like in some other scenarios, like mm. at workplaces, you're like, where else would you do that? Really? My favourite part of of playing footy, not at, at a high level, low level, anything, but it, it, even just being a part of club sport, is the fact that you hang out with people that you'd never cross paths with. Yeah. If you were to choose to because you hang you, you are you hang out of creature of habit people that are like you but you yeah. ought to be challenged hang out with different people i still tell this story of the player that did this the best that you know you look at them and they would have fitted incredibly well at geelong i'm very happy there at the yeah. giants now but yeah. sam taylor yeah there's no surprises of where he is now but when he first got drafted to um the giants he came in and his thing there was not to be liked. Not that he wasn't not yeah, liked, yeah. but it was just to yeah. go out there and just fucking compete and train and do hard. And I think yeah. for the first couple of months, you say, who is this fucking yeah. bloke? Like, what's wrong with him? Like, yeah. why is he just training and doing this and not trying to be a mate with everyone? And you fast forward two, three years later, and he's arguably one of the best fullbacks in the competition. That can can you stop there? Can not remind me of this because I think Sam went about pick 27, 28, and we had a couple of picks before that. And I knew know for a fact that we had him really on the record, and um, not that we weren't happy yeah. with the picks that we took. Of course, but when you got Sam Taylor doing what he's doing today, you're like, oh my god! Well, like on I don't know if he's on record or not, but, Je- but Jez says um, Jeremy Cameron says yeah. this day the, the hardest player. To play on is is Sam Taylor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And you, I just remember those early days, like this eighteen year old gangly kid that is just there to compete. Yeah, wrapping his arms around Jez, and Jez is even like, "What the fuck are you doing, mate?" Yeah, but yeah, it yeah. was just so cool to see yeah. him come in. Now, one of the most loved people at the club. Yeah, he's done it incredibly well. They change football clubs like yeah. uh, without knowing it. Those guys, um, and sometimes you're blessed um, within footy clubs. You know, Tom Stewart was the one for us recently that. Now he's a five-time All-Australian and you're like, oh, okay, you look forward to the next one of them and you're like the young kids, you're like, you don't need to be like him, but if you do a lot of things like him and if you want to train with him in mm. the off-season, it won't hurt you. It really won't hurt you if you mm. don't do that. Like, you, you should reach out to him a little bit more um, whilst they're still around and whilst they're doing what they're doing. So cool. The um, recruiting stuff we're talking about then, like around draft picks and stuff, like yep. how involved? W- it sounds like you have a real interest in that. Well, I did um, when you were captain, like uh, or no, playing, a little or? bit. Like the very like we were very fortunate that the club brought us in on many of the occasions of whether it be bringing someone into the yeah, footy club. Like or, that's what I want to talk about, like Dangerfield, so, Boak, all yeah, these things that are yep. nearly ha- like. So because you know that it's the flow on effect that's going to have. So I'm not the only one in that meeting, but there's twelve of us going. If we're to bring Paddy into the club, do you know what that means for the rest of you guys? So it was just a um, adult conversation. Having, do you want this to happen? Do you want to keep competing? Because um, it might mean that your contracts might come back um, to a, you know, a, yeah. a percentage, sure. you know, a different percentage. And it was just making sure that that flow-on effect was heard by as many of the individuals. So it wasn't just going to be okay, Joel and hawk we need you to take this off you and then we can fit everyone in um mm. this was a fact that everyone had to take a little bit less at different stages and Humbly. you know people go how do they fit them all in well um there was no secret in it to be honest um we're very fortunate again with where we live that we can do what we need to do and um, live comfortably but also that we want to be the best every single year that was mm. the we all had that same bug of thinking that we could win it. Probably not the right thought pattern that you should have um, when you look from outside. That, But we th- actually thought that we could put a side together and if we were playing our best footy at the right time of year, we could have a crack at winning so the cool. thing, which 
made us go to work, you know, that made us enjoy each other's company. Um, and then, yeah, fortunate enough, like 2022 may not have happened and we would have had to live with it, but it did happen. And now we're sort of, yeah, just so happy that you get to share it with those guys um, that special day. Can you, like, do you, do you remember a specific moment in those meetings? Like, actually, like, who ran them? Who was sort of facilitating them being like, all right, hey, guys, this is the plan. And is it a secretive? Like, oh, I'm assuming it's yeah. obviously secretive because it's there, yep. but... Were you like leading them? Was like how did it sort of work? Nah, nah, and and they were quite like just here, like yeah. with you, you and me in this room, Dylan. Um, but then it was yeah, probably Stephen Wells, um, footy manager at the time, mm. and then uh, the coach would be in there. But like it wasn't, there was nothing secretive about it. I think of the Gary Ablett one coming back to Geelong. Do you, guys, do you like the idea of it? And the eyeballs on guys that hadn't played with him, so like a Paddy and. Um, well, Zach Tui and all those yeah. at the time, they're like, well, Gary Ablett, yeah, let's bring him back. Like, um, imagine what he could do back here. And it wasn't um, the romance so sort of in it. We we probably understood that as older players that it was romantic to bring him back, but it was more like, we think he can bring, make us better. Mm. So um, that was always the thinking that also went into it. Did you ever, and you don't have to name names on, on these times, but there are ever times where they'd be like, hey, we're looking at this player and you guys would be like, oh, I don't reckon he's the right fit for us. Yeah, yep, yep. Um, and that would be like um, at different stages. Like we would throw up different names and that was the competitive bug that uh, our list management team loved hearing. Like mm -hmm. they loved the conversation of players wanting to go into their office to talk about someone, whether they played with them as a junior and they go, and he can do this. Mm -hmm. um, and he's not being allowed to do it at the moment at his club. But Is that with like Jared Rivers? Yeah, that maybe. So that was across? an Andrew Mackey close relationship. Yeah. So he probably knew what he could bring to the side at, um, that may help us through that period, but also the character too yeah. um, that we may have needed at the time. Um, but yeah, you just you lean on each other to, and some you get right, some you don't. You you live and die by it a little bit, as you know. Mm. Andrew Mackey, there. Did you heard his new nickname? They call him the the Adrian Dodoro of, of yeah. Uh, it, where, do we, Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. <laughs> I, I was, it, it sounds good for Geelong. I don't know. I'm not sure. It's a tough sword. But is he? From reports, I've been lucky enough to meet Mackie through through yep. you boys and through Mitch, and he's an incredibly charismatic, funny guy. Yep. Um But how do you think? he like obviously he's extremely passionate about list management and that role how have you seen it or have you spoke to him about like what what do you think he'd be like in that role well mate to be honest i've just wished him all the best yeah. like he's he's climbed into the footy manager role which is a great position to do uh, he's really passionate about the footy club yeah. and you know he, he understands that uh that's such an important role to get right you're looking after so many people um and he'll do a great job you know mm -hmm. The thing about um, the footy club, which, you know, very fortunate, I take it back to when I was a young captain, but you support your people really well and you allow them to grow, you know, and and, and he's not coming in thinking that he probably knows everything, um, just like I did as a 23-year-old. What he does well, he'll continue to do, and then he'll continue to grow from there, which is really important. Mm, it's exciting. I'm just yeah. keen to see how that plays out. And I love the fact as well that I'm, I'm assuming – from chatting to Mitch about um, his situation too in terms, you know, hopefully he continues playing for as long as he can. But there's, uh, the boys and yourself and all those guys are super proactive and going like, no, you don't just get handed a role. You have yep. to be sort of working in this and and facilitating and doing these things whilst you're playing as well to, to sort of see it out. Well, that's it, yeah. And it's going to be like Andrew played with a few of us, so it's going to be a tough role because you're going to have to sack some of your mates at different yeah. stages. So oh, um, he'll be fine with that too. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough one though, like the, those positions that yeah, when you build those relationships and we have so, so many great ones down there that um, there'll come a time and, and as footy players, you don't necessarily always get your own way. No, no. And and no one's sort of bigger than the, the jumper. Nah, and that's correct. what it is. Yep. Um, leadership. Yep. Obviously, captain of the club for yep. 12 many? years. 12 years. Yeah. yeah. 23 yep. years of age, you, you took over. Obviously, there's two different, well, there's many facets of leadership on field, off field. Yep. Your on field stuff looks like it really took care of itself um, in the way you played and prepared. And, and that's yep. not by, like, it's just the way you are. Yep. How do you think, and did you, put a lot of effort in the development of the off-field stuff and maybe mentors, things you found really 
um, beneficial in that space? And even if there's any anecdotes of times that you maybe got it wrong early yep. in your career? Uh, so the, the on-field stuff, like that was the thing that I've obviously come most natural to me. Um, I was um, being captain at 23 and then told, but we just want you to continue to do what you do. So at that stage, it was try and get better every time that I come into the club. Don't confuse it with anything else. Yep. Um, you know, work on all that, you know, parts of your game and just keep an eye out for others around you. So I could do that um, and feel like that that was, you know, the thing that I need to do. I was lucky I had guys around me that were good in the media, um, that looked after different parts of the footy club that I didn't even know. Um, a young coach at the time, Chris Scott, was 34, 35 when I become captain. So he was still the face um, of the footy club. It didn't really need me mm -hmm. um, to be a captain that was loud and out there like um, sometimes some of the clubs need now. Um, but good support with Neil Baum, Steve Hocking, um, Brian Cook, uh, Frank Costa, Colin Carter. Um, sorry, I'm going through a, a lot of names yeah. that people won't But there are know, a lot of names now that are at massive roles at other clubs yeah. too like you, you look at like Neil Baum obviously with Richmond yep. and at Carlton well, Cookie, got a few cookies, cookies at Carlton there. yeah yep. and, um, yep. so yeah the, the best thing about it, they just allowed me to sort of grow as a captain um, at my own speed um, they put real emphasis on getting Saturday right so Saturday's game day um, and around that there was felt no pressure like um, the guys that would look after me on the ground were guys that were older than me um, trying to help you know the club be the best in the game that you know we could possibly be so I felt really fortunate that that could play out like that um, and then as I went on you sort of you learn um, what else will make the club you know mm. better than what it is and free agency came in and I reckon that's where my captaincy changed a little bit without me probably knowing it at the start like I'd uh, when you're bringing a guy in from a different club, whether they come for the reason that, you know, Paddy and, you know, you may be the best player in the league and we think that we can make you the best player in the league, or whether it be a Zach Tui that got offered a one-year contract to Carlton and we may have said, well, we'll give you two, but we think well, you can play for a long time. So mm. he's maybe a bit bruised by something that he's heard um, and gone, well, these guys are going to give me a shot. So you have to unbruise them a little bit and go this is your club too so make it what you want and we've had so many great stories um, through free agency period so so lucky that guys have wanted to choose the Geelong footy club to come mm. to um, and at stages it's been pretty hard to sort of make them feel like that Geelong's their club because we got to the start of the 2020 season and I remember sitting in a meeting um, that I was taking at the time and I just said to the guys, if you were here five years ago, could you stay standing up? And there was only six of us. So in that time, we'd had 39 new players. Wow. in. So we'd had a big list changeover with peop without people sort of recognising it. Um, and it was like, so this club's ours now and we need to get together with it really quickly um, if we're to want to play off on that last day in September. Sorry. So... Um, and the boys got it, like they got it, and then they picked it up. And you know, we kept doing some things the Geelong way that always did, but we would keep building because we wanted to be better. Um, I know that, that the answer is probably no to this, but just on to harp on that point, like, has there been times where you haven't been? Because it's very like I'm not saying planning you out to be the that you've never made a mistake at all. You <laughs> might not have, but has there been times where you've gone? And not reacted in a leadership position or anything that you go. I learned from that. I didn't do oh, that properly. I learned, but through so many. Yeah. Um, got asked to do um, rate the players, um, and this was early in my captaincy. Mm -hmm. I reckon I was twenty four or twenty five. But rate the players on you know how I see them against our values. And one of my closest friends, Tom Lonigan, um, we were up on a camp um, on the New South Wales coast. And I ranked him low. Um, it was maybe on ruthlessness or something like that. And um, and he hated it. And he brought it up with me and hit me between the eyes. And I, I wasn't ready for it because I was just like, you know, I was filling out it for 46 different blokes because the 
leadership consultant at the time said, well, you're the captain, so you must be the best at it, so you rank everyone else. And so I'm going through, probably got a bit tired of a night time and might have given him a six out of 10 rather than a eight. And he wasn't happy with it. And it was like one of those things that you're just like, okay, if you're not to do things, you know, 100%, yeah. um, then sometimes you just shouldn't do them at all. Um, so, oh, and I had many of those occasions. Sometimes I, I think of, you know, I think of the players that um, have only spent small periods of time at the club and I was like, could I have helped them spend a little bit longer? You know, would have they been, would have they been a better player if I was able to do that? So a good um, lesson and I think when players sit back and they make a milestone game, say a 100th or 150th game, you get a lot of messages from people. And the messages that I used to love were the ones that played one or two, two games yeah. with you or none. Uh, because they say, thanks, um, all the best this weekend, congratulations on your milestone, and thanks for the time that I had at the club. You're like, ah, they're the special ones. Um, and little do they know that they have the big impact on me. Um, you know, played 305 games with Hawk. Yep, that's one of my favourite messages. But the one that played, you know, such a minimal time with me or worked within the footy club, um, they're, the, they're the special ones. That's huge, man. That's such a, it's such an incredible point. Like, I think... Um, and right back to all of them. Yeah. Yeah, right back to all of them. Don't do it later. Like, right back to them and know them that it was a, mm. that you really appreciate it. I was about to agree with you. And then I I, I must admit, like, my writing back, that not in a, just in a serious note, like, I always go, fuck, that's an incredible message. I'm going to get back to that. I did it yep. to my best mate, sent me an incredible message this week. Yep. And I was like, I sort of want to give it the attention it deserves, but if you don't do it in the moment, you just yeah. you're never going to do it. So you yeah. actually just have to stop and and get it done. Yeah, I agree. Um, I love your point though about the not the uh, the correct term, like the players that only spent time with you or even staff upstairs. Yeah, I found that was um, a really special one for me. It's been funny since leaving the game. I I loved football clubs and um you know the like versus respected thing for sure but one thing i always did was i love communicating and connecting with people and the amount of relationships that i have out of footy is nearly split between the players but also the administration staff yeah yeah and it's so funny the shit that like pops back up years later that you know you hang out with one of these guys upstairs who started in the sales department and he was 18 and you're just chilling out with him but now He's the head of the, the sales department. Yeah. Not that you're doing it for any gain at all, but it's just crazy. You know, if you're a good person to anyone on their yep. journey, it, it, it can pay you back later that you don't even know. So true. So true. And like you celebrate, I think that's um, the one thing that we're getting better at, you know, as Australians more than anything, but celebrate those mm. uh, individuals and times um, through those periods. What do you want to do next? Uh, it's a good question. Like, <laughs> I get this question a lot. Like, what are you, what are you going to do? What are you yeah. going to do? Um, I love the game, like uh, AFL, and uh, I'll get back in it. I love um, – I have a sort of bug to make it want to be – I want it to be the best. You know, I already think it's the best, but I think it can be better again. So um, continue to just make it, you know, take it to the next level, um, just like footy. Um, and then, you know, the thing about it, I think people are in a rush for me to go and, you know, do you want to coach? Do you want to, you know – be a high administrator and all that and you're like maybe one day but I'm happy to get the coffees first and do the work first and get back into that because I did play straight away as an 18 year old um, <clears throat> and I did have respect for those guys that were the glue in between the side but I never sat as that too so mm -hmm. it was like I need to go and I'm going to go do the work and stuff like that, feel okay with um, what the footy world looks like and just see it from a different angles, um, work with as many people as I can um, and, yeah, try and make myself better. For someone that was uh, in the glue, in and out, like in that position, yep. it's actually where you learn the most. Like, yeah. You learn the most of that period of like not being the best but not being down the bottom and you're sort of navigating and it's such an invaluable part of yep. learning yep. Um, I'm really excited for whatever that is that you're, you're going to be doing when you said you want the game to be the best just interested in your take like where do you think the game can improve like I, yeah. I sit back now and not that I had any career like you but I 
I feel like I'm always just like, why are we changing the fucking rules? Why are we doing this? Yeah. And I'm already like that 90 year old guy. And I'm like, I've got to forget that there is perceptions. We're doing things for a reason, obviously. Yeah. But um, yeah, what would you, what, what, have well, you thought about anything of that yeah, sort of stuff? So, like, so we're changing the rules because the coaches get too smart and they then make it boring. So yeah, we have to keep changing it for them. Do you think that's just going to like always happen? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so. I do. So the, like we just have to continue. So like this, you look at the grand final that we just had, great grand it's final. Fantastic. And like, I don't know whether it was meant or not, but I didn't hear the stand rule sort of on the microphone once uh, maybe because the crowd was so loud but we just evolve and you know the players evolve first um, and then the coaches will come around to about how they're going to make it better and they're going to beat that rule um, so we have to keep changing different rules to make sure that we stay ahead of what's coming um, mm. the one thing that gets me back I, I said it a couple of times recently but um, I've been working with the NAB Oz Kick program for a long long time and, uh, Very good. Yeah, well, the girl uh, and girls are a big part of the program now. But this year, we were at the hotel where they had the Oz Kicker of the Year um, awards, and the girls were bouncing the ball like so naturally, like the guys that you're like, that's why I want to get back into footy mm. because look at that. The, the games like the girls' game isn't going to be like the boys' game, but geez, they're going to be they're going to put a good product out there. Um, and we just have to accept that that's going to be a lot better than what it is coming up, and it's it's getting better quicker and quicker. Um, so we have to keep making the men's game better and better too. So th I think the development of men's game needs to go up again. Um, we need to keep finding players. I love what the Irish guys do. Yeah. Um, I've always because we played with three of them, <laughs> oh, and more over the period of time. But I played in Premiership with two of them. Um, but yeah, we, we just have to keep finding the best players and make sure that our sport's the number one pick sport um, for men and women. Yeah, so cool. That point just on Mark O'Connor, he has to be one of my favourite players. Like <laughs> I don't know him, but I just hear a lot about like how much he's loved player yeah, in that team. He is. Um, and the thing about Mark too is like he's a genuine leader too mm. so that people follow him. Um, loved amongst many, but we've, we've been fortunate but we, we've found that the irish um if they fit in really well to geelong the community it's colder uh it's maybe a little bit colder at different stages but they just yeah they make us better um and and we celebrate um the people that they are too so cool um mate i really appreciate your your time today it's been genuinely unbelievable to sit down and reflect and um and yeah have a chat about your story all the the learnings and, and i can't wait to see what the next sort of 12 months has in store not just on a business level but family um level as well and congratulations to you and brit um Thank you. love you seeing you guys on instagram and living you know i feel like i have taken such a keen eye on just watching what you guys are up to because you're like that two months ahead of where we are um so i'd love to get the boys together one day and um i reckon max has a bit of grit in him that's reckon, good yeah, nah, yeah joey's I, just starting to wrestle so yeah I, max has been doing it for a while has he yeah good yeah so we might have to put him in a yeah, ring he's a bit more developed actually he's very very good at that sort of stuff <laughs> which is good uh, let's go thanks for having me on mate thank you mate cheers